The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, it's about worm and worm castings, as well as the art of canning. Our guest is author Pam Pinnock, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full. Join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you are along for another show. I am your host, Joey Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. If you want to be part of the program, well, whether you're listening to us on one of the 18 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2022 through our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com under the season six tab at the top of the page, in studio video replay, podcast replay, however you're listening to us. Thank you. If you want to be part of the program, hey, come on. We would like to have you be part of the program. You can do that in two different avenues. Send us an email, garden talk radio at gmail.com. That's garden talk radio at gmail.com. Send us a question. Let us know where you're listening from. Say hi. Fine with us. We will uh, do what we can uh, to help you with any questions, and we'll say hi back to you. If you do have a question about a particular uh, problem, if you can include a photograph, that would make it very much appreciated on our end. We could help better identify that situation. Garden talk radio at gmail.com. If you would like to give us a call, you can do that on the Proclamation Hotline brought to you by Proclamation Goods. That number is toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. Proclamation Goods creates cookware for the eco-conscious home chef. Their pans are non-toxic, have a lifetime warranty, and are made in Wisconsin. Their award-winning stainless steel Proclamation Duo cookware set is a 12-inch skillet and a stockpot that doubles as a wok. Best of all, the skillet and stockpot hinge together to form a Dutch oven. It's two pans with a versatility of 10, empowering you to cook more with less. If you care about your health and strive for a more sustainable lifestyle, then Proclamation Goods is for you. Supplies limited to orders, not proclamationgoods.com. All righty, proclamationgoods.com. Thank you very much for supporting the program as well as all of the sponsors you've heard and are hearing. These are people that uh, support the program financially in order for us to bring the program to you. These are things, these are companies we've worked hard to build a relationship with and trustworthy products. So uh, support them because they support us. Well, simple uh, worm castings is a simple way in order to enhance or feed your soil in an organic means, Holly. And worm castings are nothing more than the droppings or the manure or the byproduct of worms themselves. Right. So worms are amazing little creatures, earthworms. They eat or you know decompose their own body weight in one day. So overall, over throughout that time, a one worm can produce one half pound a year of their own waste. So and, you think of a tiny worm. Right. You know, that's a lot of waste. And we're not, we're talking about the old fashioned, traditional, you grew up, you saw them in the garden worms. We're not kind of talking about jumping worms or hammerhead worms. Those are in, in, in invasive species that are dangerous and a whole other mess that we're not going to deal with today. Uh, worm castings is uh, some people will grow strictly in worm castings. Other people will use worm castings as a top dressing or a, a liquid fertilizer. Now, uh, Simple Grow is a company that sponsors the program. They sell bag, bulk, ton, truckload of 100% worm castings at simplegrow.com. Phenomenal products. Uh, if you have not used worm castings and you are going to, you might as well get the best from the best, which is Simple Grow, uh, in order to feed your plants now worm castings and I, I can't speak for other companies i can speak for simple grow they don't smell so you could and you can and people do take them worm castings and top dress their indoor plants and there's no odor that is emitted from them it's a 
uh, smell-free fertilizer, natural fertilizer. Right. So the humus or, yeah, the humus and earthworm castings will help increase the soil's water retention. It improves soil aeration, which just means kind of like those little air pockets in soil that naturally exist there. And then it also provides anchor plant nutrients that would otherwise leach away water. So um, anchor plants can be anything from grasses to... It can be a weed. It can be a weed, yep. Um, it can be your perennial plants. It can be... Isn't this what nature uses to cover bare soil to keep it? Just yeah. anything that can grow in that yep. particular ecosystem. Right. Um, and so, that's why you see weeds grow, uh, you know, in driveways, in anywhere that there's not consistent uh, impact of traffic of human or mechanical, uh, the middle of a driveway, the middle of a dirt path, uh, that's why anything to cover it, to cover bare soil. Right. And so this will, this helps feed those anchor plants, um, perhaps maybe instead where they would lose their nutrients. A lot of the anchor plants probably don't need many nutrients as they grow out of driveways but this if you ha if you do have perennials and you feel that you want to help feed them more you might want to put some worm castings in and kind of side dress it and mm -hmm. that would help them uh nature nature uh worms in your garden and the university of wisconsin uh has said that you should have about 12 worms per square foot give or take nine to 12 worms per square foot um, and some of you may have much more. We did a test many years ago, and we had 24 in one cubic block of soil. We extracted out, counted it. Some may have very little. Now, if you do not have the worms in your garden that you think you should or you don't have them at all, you don't want to bring worms in. You don't want to just go to your bait shop or go to your wherever shop and, and mail order 10,000 worms. That's not going to be good. Why is that not going to be good, Holly? So worms, you know, they exist in their own ecosystem and then you have worms in your, your ecosystem in your backyard or wherever you have your garden. And if you bring in worms from another source, it could, they could, you know, not get along necessarily. It could become overcrowded. It could just be a myriad of problems. Diseases could be yeah, diseases. Uh, transferred from variety or, or species to species. So what you can do is you can invite the worms. How do we do that? You yeah. send them a, an evite e on, online, yeah. yeah. Um, so you just add, you add compost, any sort of organic material to your garden. And somehow they know. They will migrate, and this is not going to happen like overnight. You put the compost down, oh, you got a, a colony of worms. It's going to take several months. But once you get them in your area, and they come, I don't, I don't know, I guess they smell this compost or the, the, the good soil. I'm sure there's a scientific, and I haven't looked into that. Um, they will appear. You will dig the soil and you'll see worms. Now, people often till and people kill a lot of worms. And we're not saying you should or shouldn't. We choose not to till for a variety of reasons. Um, if you're concerned about the um, slaughter of worms, you can limit how much damage you can do to the worms. Now, and we don't till because we think we, we, we know that science has proven that there is a lot of structurally structural damage done to the soil web and all that by tilling but if you choose to till that's your deal you turn the tiller on set it on top of the area in which you're going to till for about three to five minutes that will send pulses of vibrations to the soil and through the soil and worms are smart enough the smart ones they will start burrowing down deeper because they know that vibration is similar to rain and when there's a lot of rain they, the soil gets too wet and the worms will migrate down deeper. Worms can go down as far as uh, conservatively eight, eight feet. feet. Yeah. 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 Uh, so they can get down and away from the danger. And then that is a limitation of the amount of worms that you could potentially damage with your tiller. Real quick, I just want to touch on ahead. some disadvantages. It does take time to create worm castings. 90 days um, is the minimum. So you want to keep that in mind that if you are going to try to create your own worm castings with like a worm bin, it does take some time. And sometimes if you do purchase worm castings, they're a little bit more costly than other fertilizers. So that's something to keep but in mind. But it's all natural. Well. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like it's, it's one of those... Um, you cost versus reward right. type of situations. 
And yeah, but as far as you wanting to create your own, it does take a little bit of time and that's fine. And you can create your own compost. There's a lot of different options as to how to fertilize your garden and what works for you and your budget. So if you are looking for, and I don't want this to turn into some type of info commercial, but I do want to tell you about good products, uh, simplegrow.com. Uh, you can buy it by the bag, bulk, truckload, or ton, uh, simplegrow.com for your worm castings. And and when you get the worm castings, they don't give you anything else. It's just worm castings. That's it. Absolutely. Um, so worms, they are your friends. They do a lot of things that you are not and we are not aware of that greatly help not only your garden, but nature itself. I used to collect worms when I was a kid. Oh, another Holly story. <laughs> you have tuned in a couple of weeks ago. It was a story about paper birch trees. Birch and today is about worms. Tell us the story about collecting worms, Holly, because I'm sure many people have waited <laughs> A week and a half plus I, for this. I liked worms. I I've, I always have liked playing in the dirt, digging in the soil. You didn't eat the worms, I did? didn't eat the oh. worms, no. Okay. But I do have a picture. I'm sure my mom has it of me pretending to eat a worm. Um, So I actually probably have a picture of that as an adult. Um, So yeah, I would collect these worms and I put them in this orange Tupperware container. And I had a little worm friend. These worms did not make it back out. They died, didn't they? I think... Probably. You didn't use them for fishing or anything. No. You just collected them like an ant farm, but yeah. it was a started off good but ended <laughs> badly. Right. And then but then I I learned that because you know when it rains they come to the surface. No, they go down. Well, some some, some of them go some, the, yeah, 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 some of them go So up. that's when I would that would be prime worm collecting time. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're happy for for that story. <laughs> Well, another thing you can be happy about is what Walton's Incorporated offers for you. You are uh, concerned about where your meat comes from. If you're a butcher uh, or a meat processing individual, you want to know what's going in or how to do that or have the right tools. Walton's Inc. has all of that for you. We are brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from, canning, preserving, everything. Walton's Inc. has everything you need to make any type of meat product. You can also go to meatgistics.com to help educate yourself on hows and whys of meat processing, as well of a community of 15,000 users who will help give their opinion and guidance on meat processing issues. Um, they have decades of experience. Walton'sInc.com does. Meatgistics.com, you can make some... Uh, you know, uh, help find some support there. They have a full line of sausage stuffers, mixers, meat grinders, um, seasoning, stuff to make jerky, snack sticks, and all that you, good and, stuff. And they have kitchen supplies, uh, spices. If you don't, if you're not a butcher, they've got tools and what you can use for your grill to your stove top. Absolutely. So if you go to waltonsinc.com, Walton's everything but the meat, use code GROW50 to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more and get free shipping. Well, when we come back, it's the art of canning. You're listening to The Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Japanese beetles show up in summer for a feeding frenzy in your garden. And they are the worst party guest. Feeding on leaves, then laying eggs in your lawn for next year. Japanese beetles can decimate your plants and trees. Protect your plants with Japanese beetle traps from rescue. New this year, rescue has refilled lures to use the same trap again the next year. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Take the guesswork out of composting with hot bin composting. Quickly break down food scraps within 30 to 90 days. Find out more at hotbincomposting.com. Get $25 off your favorite hot bin model through august 15th that's hot bin 26 gallon mini or the hot bin 52 gallon mk2 use coupon code joey22 at checkout to take 25 off your order at hotbincomposting-usa.com 
Hey gardeners, it's that time of growing season, so let's start canning. Head over to Fleet Farm for all of your canning supplies and jam mixes. In one easy stop, find everything you need, like jars, lids, canners, strainers, racks, spatulas, and funnels from top brands like Ball & Kerr. Plus, pick up mixes, sugar, and more. When it comes to canning, get everything you need at your canning headquarters, Fleet Farm. This week's garden tip is sponsored by the amazing Dr. Zymes. Eliminate and prevent garden pests with their 100% all-natural, all-in-one insecticide and fungicide. Experience powerful natural protection from insects, fungus, mold, and mildew. Try a free sample. Visit drzymes.com forward slash garden talk. Beneficial insects are the key to a healthy plant. But using spray and chemicals can be harmful as many are non-selective, which means it kills all the bugs, good and bad. The amazing Dr. Zymes Eliminator is different and will kill the bad bugs and not harm the good ones. Keeping the good bugs will keep the bad bugs away. Kill soft body insects effectively and safely. Dr. Zymes is Omri listed, safe up to the day of harvest, and doesn't leave a residue. That helpful garden tip was sponsored by the amazing Dr. Zymes. Eliminate and prevent garden pests with their 100% all-natural, all-in-one insecticide and fungicide. Experience powerful natural protection from insects, fungus, mold, and mildew. Try a free sample. Visit drzymes.com forward slash garden talk. Thanks for listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Chip Drop, Bell Buster, Johnny Appleseed, Ivy Organic, Milkweed Balm, Waltons Incorporated, Bloomin' Easy Plants, Jung Seeds. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Moments away, we're going to talk about the art of canning. But first, it's dry, it's hot, plants are thirsty, tree diapers the answer. Tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases water on the base of any tree or plant as the soil dries. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. No more overwatering or underwatering with the tree diaper. Every time it rains, the tree diaper recharges. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Water your plants and trees, whether they're by the house, down the road, or in the back 40. Also works under mulch. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Made in the USA, you can find all the sizes they have available at treediaper.com. Treediaper.com works as advertised, and we've got it in our garden, and it works even better. So Holly is a multi-award winning Wisconsin State Fair canner, has taken multiple classes with certified master canners, and we're going to talk about canning uh, for those who are new or just beginning. Number one, it's not as scary as you think it is, and number two, you got to follow the directions, and I'll let you take it from there uh, when it comes to water bath canning. We're not going to talk about pressure canning uh, specifically. We're more water bath canning. Absolutely. So the biggest thing is to follow a, well, the biggest thing is to consider your safety and not to cut corners, take shortcuts, um, anything like that. It's not a situation where you're, you know, sauteing some vegetables and you might use a little bit more oil or garlic or onion or something. This is something where you want to follow the recipe, you want to follow the recipe exactly, and you want to follow a safe, trusted recipe. Now, whenever we are canning, we want, like you said, a trusted, safe recipe, because we have gone to, back when people used to come out and do garden talks, we would do a number of garden talks, and we had a talk called Basics of Canning, where you would mock through a demonstration of how to safely water bath an item. And there would be people who would come and individuals that would say, well, I do it this way, and I have figured out, that, and, and, and there was an individual, and I remember... He had figured you don't you never can rice, okay? You don't can rice. You, rice is a dry good that you keep in a bag, okay? Right, or some sort of airtight right. container. And, and he said that he figured out that you could put 319 grams of rice in the jar and pressure can it and make it stand. 
don't do. And there was another person that pressure jammed, a pressure canned jam. There are certain things, don't do it. <laughs> right, right. It's like there's there's there's. It's, I remember that guy. Yeah, yeah. There, there's recipes it's, for it's a reason. It's kind of like it's it's not worth the effort. I think he just did it to say he did it. You know, like you get sick of maybe watching TV or something, and then you're like, I'm just gonna figure out how to pressure can this jam. If, I don't know. If you've got that situation, and God bless you if you do, send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail dot com, and I'll give you some suggestions of things you can do uh, on 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 to help us out. How about that? That sounds good. Yeah. How about that? So um, anyway, you want to follow a trusted recipe. So you want to make sure it's within the last ten to fifteen years. How do you know if it is? You can look at the book where you get it from. You're going to look at that copyright in the front page. Okay. Um, You can, if you're not sure, if it seems like a questionable website where it's, you know, some um, homesteader or somebody who, and no, nothing against homesteaders. I appreciate your information that you provide for us. New new and improved. And I, you know, or I created this, I created this recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, nothing against your whatever you've got going on your website, but if it's like I created this canning recipe, it's like is it safe? I don't know. So something that's been created in a kitchen of a uh, professional. So there's things like Better Homes and Gardens, um, the anything ball blue book, anything ball canning is fine. Um, Taste of Home is another good resource, and then anything that has been published by a master canner. So there is SB Canning. She's got a lot of good recipes. Um, there's somebody in Pennsylvania who wrote a couple of books on canning. Um, so there's some options for you. But if it's just, you know, Mary Kate on the local homestead and she's like, I just came up with this recipe, I I wouldn't trust it. You know, a lot of times people will see like bacon jam is a safe Probably not. What, and there's been things, and I'll, I'll reference, uh, I think it's a two two types of jam in one jar. Uh, this was a big thing back years and years ago in the 50s and 40s, 50s, 60s. Now it's not safe to do, where you put literally two different varieties of jam in one jar, and you have like a, a lime, a lime co- or a green and a red or a blue, whatever the colors are, you'd have them top bottom. That's not safe anymore. So science and people who have died possibly because of the way the canning was done it's been modified to make it safer so you're not it, it's not totally safe nothing is 100 percent safe but if you follow the recipe follow the trusted source do exactly as it says you have nothing to be concerned with absolutely so yeah you want to follow the recipe um you want to prepare so you want, starting with the recipe you want to read the entire thing and because Joey and I have learned that sometimes you have to let stuff soak for three hours. Overnight, overnight too. Yeah. Um, whatever. And you're like, okay, I'm going to make this recipe. And then you get partway through and it says soak for 12 hours. Yeah. And Seven like, o'clock on a Sunday night. Oh, we're going to wrap this up before bedtime. And well, that didn't happen. Right. So you want to keep that in mind um, just to make sure you also have the ingredients on hand. Check your stock. If you have wide mouth jars and regular mouth lids, that might not work out for you. Um, just stuff like that. Do I have lemon juice? Do I have fresh lemon? Not fresh lemon juice, but do I have a bottle of lemon juice that is not expired? Vinegar, sugar, canning salt, what have you. You want to make sure that you have those ingredients on hand. Um, and also just follow the process. Know that you have to get your canner going to get it up to boiling before you want to put the jars in. And if you have questions in regards to this, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And if you want to go to our YouTube channel, which you just go to YouTube and search The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, uh, we have a playlist of 44 different canning what you grow. And we've got some canning tips. We've got a number of videos that uh, focus on doing it and doing it correctly and what you need to know and, and how to do it right. Absolutely. And then you want to follow the recipe. You want to work quickly, especially if you're making something like cucumber pickles. Cucumber pickles have a tendency to get mushy. So you want to do the recipe uh, swiftly, quickly. Obviously, don't lose any steps or don't you know miss any steps. Something um, 
where you're just like, I don't need to warm up my jars. I'm going to put hot the hot stuff into the cold room temperature jars <coughs> into the hot canner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've done that. Uh-huh. And, it, you know, you never just do it once. You're like, oh, what was that noise? Well, Let me put this in here. Well, let's then... go back to the pickle thing. The, the, the speed or the uh, acceleration of the pickling process, why is that? Why And, and why do you recommend pickles to being in quarts and, or a pints instead of quarts? Um, for one, they pickles when you make them they take a little bit of time to process you want to anything you pickle you want to give it time to um not the canning process but once they're on the shelf you want to give them time to do the pickling thing yeah yeah. so if you put them in pint jars they're going to essentially pickle faster and less time in the canner right less time in the canner which can uh, can result in a a potential of mushier not as crisp uh, yeah cucumber pickle right and that's why we you know recommend using pickling cucumbers versus something else so um if you're a real big fan of homemade pickles I'm not that big of a fan of homemade pickles. What? I know. Yeah. But there's certain things that I just grew up with that taste a certain way to me. Right. And um, homemade pickles just don't do the same. I don't really eat that many pickles anyway. So. Okay. Um, but yeah, whatever you like. Jams, definitely want to not overcook your jam because, or undercook it because you could have, end up with syrup or you can end up with very gelatinous jam. Right. And then you got to follow the processing time. And then once the jars come out, uh, you don't you want to make sure. When, well, another thing before we wrap this up, when we put the jars in the water bath canner, the water is boiling. We are ready to start the processing. You've got the tomato, the the, the diced tomatoes or the the whole tomatoes in the jar. Water is boiling. You put the lid on, and you don't crank it very tight. You you finger tighten it, but you don't crank it so hard that the process of the air escaping to create the vacuum to create the sound uh, doesn't exist because when people pull the jars out of the canner pressure or water bath and the jar the flat portion is too tight it will buckle and that is why it is buckling is because it has been too tight and the air was escaping to the point where it was burning or busting that flat portion that lid off of the actual jar Right. So you want to you want to take the ring off when you store them. Um, once they're out of the canner, you want to make sure that the lid is sealed. And if it's not sealed, you can either recan it or reprocess it. I mean, like, re put it in the water bath canner. Pickles do not do that. Don't reprocess them because they're just going to turn mushy. Just put them in the fridge and eat them within like three to six months. So, I mean, that's a brief, brief summary of, I mean, we can talk about basics of canning the art of canning for two shows and not have everything covered um, to the uh, utmost degree. So uh, if you got any questions, Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com, YouTube channel, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and click on the playlist. And there's several canning playlists in which you can uh, run through, and uh, there's a lot of detailed visualization uh, the particular items and how to do such. Well, Holly Summers here. It's hot. It's unbearable in some situations, but that does not stop those Japanese beetles from wreaking havoc on anything and everything in and out of your garden. If you're looking to successfully control beetle invaders without damaging the environment, look no further than Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts derived from a naturally occurring soil bacteria. Beetle Gone is the only organic solution that successfully controls beetle invaders. Just mix the powder with water and spray on your plants. Once ingested, the targeted pest will stop feeding and die. And since it's an organic BT product, you know it's a great choice to use on your fruits and veggies in addition to your ornamental flowers and trees. Not only does Beetle Gone work, but... It's the only product that is safe to use around beneficial insects such as luddy bugs, butterflies, and bees, and has zero water toxicity. Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts. Find out more at BeetleGone.com. And when you purchase, be sure to include the coupon code GARDENTALK10 to save 10% on your order at BeetleGone.com. Hang out with us. Author Pam Penrick Penrick will be with us right after this. You're listening to The Garden with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Have a garden question? 
Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Do you have nuts or fruit in your yard? A nut wizard is a handy, effective tool that will pick up round or oval tree produce quickly and easily, leaving debris behind for a clean harvest. A nut wizard tool saves your back and your time. Visit nutwizard.com for more information. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use code 10 TG22 to receive 10% off your order at jungseed.com. That code again is 10TG22. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ChipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. A non-selective herbicide that is also USDA certified? You bet. No More Weeds by Naturally Green Products. The same great company that brings you no more bugs, no more weeds. Kills weeds with no harsh chemicals, no glyphosate. No More Weeds is a commercial grade vinegar base with a propriety sticking agent. Great around pools, decks, patios, etc. Visit natgreenproducts.com, enter promo code WEEDS, W-E-E-D-S, and buy three one-gallon size units, get the fourth one free. Thanks for listening to the Guardian with Joe and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Rootmaker, Dripworks, Pomona Universal Pectin, Phylum Bioproducts, Tree Diaper, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Water Hoop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Pam Pinnock will be with us, author about saving water in your garden. But first, a product that will make your plants smile. That is Simple Grow. Are you worried about your plant growth? Provide your plants with what they need to grow to their potential. Simple Grow offers 100% organic worm castings at simplegrow.com. Unlike other worm casting products, when you order from Simple Grow, you are getting 100% worm castings, not filler plus castings. You can promote ideal soil structure and aeration with Simple Grow's all natural odor free worm castings. There's only one ingredient worm castings. No chemicals or additives will seep into their food, and it doesn't smell like other fertilizers for indoor and outdoor use. You can order by the bag, bundle, ton, or truckload. Check out what Simple Grow has to offer at with their 100% worm castings at simplegrow.com. Well, Holly, let's go to the Proclamation Hotline brought to you by Proclamation Goods and bring in our guest for this week. Pam Pennick is an avid gardener, author of Lawn Gone and The Water Saving Gardening, roving photographer and former professional designer of many a water-wise garden in Austin, Texas. Welcome to the program, Pam. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us, not only educating Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country. And we want to talk to you first about uh, your book, Lawn Gone. What can you tell us that would uh, make our listeners want to pick up a copy? What's unique about it? Maybe a bit uh, of something that we would not normally have thought would be in that book. Well, um, Lawn Gone is meant to do two things. It's first meant to inspire readers to think outside the lawn box and show what you can do with your yard instead of just carpeting the whole thing and turf grass and mowing every week. Um, Second, it's providing practical information on actually how to get rid of your lawn and replace it with something else, which a lot of people just don't know where to begin. So that's that's, um, one of the things that it's really trying to help people out with. And what you might replace it with could be like a mix of ground covers or no-mow grasses or spreading perennials, sedges, things like that. And also to get people thinking about people places um, that they can take up space with, like patios or play areas or contemplative spaces like a hammock zone or a fire pit seating area, stuff like that. Um, The book also includes tips on dealing with lawn loving HOAs, which a lot of people run into when they're thinking about taking out some lawn and includes um, regional suggestions for ground covering plants from different parts of the country. 
Well, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, there are certain municipalities, uh, metropolitan areas, that actually give tax credits or pay homeowners to get rid of that grass and put something more natural in. That's true. People should definitely look that up. Um, <clears throat> I'm here in Austin, Texas, and Austin has definitely um, offered rebates for drought-tolerant plantings and that sort of thing. So everyone, before they start, should look into that and see if that's something their city offers. And, and I know what a lot of people are going to think. Well, a lawn, you got to have a lawn. you got to have grass. you got to do all these things. Growing up on the farm, and I've talked about this on the program, if the grass didn't grow, that meant we didn't have to mow it. If we didn't have any manicured lawn, it was just another task in which we had to do, and as long as it got mowed, that was the end of the story. Right, right. Just uh, Essentially, you're just mowing whatever is growing Correct. there. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, a lot of people call that freedom lawns, you know, the, uh, when you just let a lawn – get full of the weeds that some people work so hard to get rid of like clover and that sort of thing we were let ahead, it grow we were ahead of our time that's right <laughs> no need to no need to set yourself up for a, a workload that you don't really want to do or enjoy or you know especially when you can grow so many other great plants right so you grow in texas zone 8b what are some tips for gardeners in a similar climate as yours especially when it feels too hot or impossible to grow anything yeah, it, it can really feel that way in the summertime here, um, which, especially this summer. Um, it's been 100 degrees for weeks on end, no rain. Um, so the first thing I tell people um, in climates like mine is don't plant in the summer. Like don't fall prey to the idea that you got to use the summertime to start a new garden. It's the worst time. So I, I don't even like to plant here after April unless it's something like a supremely heat and dry loving plant like a yucca or an agave or something like that. But summer is a great time to plan a garden here. Um, maybe in your climate, it would be winter when people would plan a garden, but here summer can be a great time to do it. Um, and in fact, you can even like, I tell people like, as you're looking out the window and watching your lawn shrivel up under the Death Star, it just put that Death Star to work and use it to help you kill your lawn. You can use the sun to help you solarize your lawn and just let it cook all summer under some plastic or the lasagna method where you pile up your cardboard and compost and mulch and let it just cook all summer long under there. And then come the fall in October when we get cooler weather and hopefully some rain, you can then be ready to go with your new garden design and that's a great time to plant so that's what i tell people especially if they're new to our area is shift when you're thinking about your gardening seasons and for many of our listeners we we don't have the uh, f the avail ability to grow almost year round it's usually about a two and a half season uh four month deal and you guys mm -hmm. down in texas though you can't grow in the hot summer months you guys have more growing season than many of many of us up in the north uh, are available to have. But also, we don't have four or five, six weeks of triple-digit heat. So I think that's a, a trade-off we're willing to have. There's trade-offs everywhere, that's for sure. And, uh, yeah, even though we're not planting in the summer, of course, there are lots of plants that do thrive here and, and will look good all summer. So the key is just not to be putting your shovel in the ground at that time unless it's something that's really kind of a desert sort of plant. Um, and yeah, we can plant all winter long here, and I do. It's it's a great time to plant from October through late April, early May. But that all works really well. Well, let's talk about your other book, Water Saving Garden. Could be a benefit to pretty much anybody in the country, regardless Texas or to Maine to Oregon. What are some uh, you, something unique in that book that uh, would help us and would encourage our listeners to pick a copy up? Sure. So it's a book for, for gardeners in any climate who want to be more water conscious. Um, you know, dry climate readers will want to know ways of collecting and holding rainwater in their gardens and making their gardens more water efficient. But in wetter climates, readers can learn how to make rain gardens and design their gardens so that runoff doesn't overwhelm storm drains. Um, I'd say the most unique section, uh, the one that uh, many readers have told me they really enjoyed is, is part four, um, which is really kind of a fun section. It's about creating the illusion of water in a garden. And it's really just full of creative ideas for evoking water through the use of stone or like glass pebbles, wavy grasses, um, cascading plants, mirrors, just different ways to um, – 
create the look of water in a garden without using any. And so it's just, it's fun. I've, I've, I got pictures for that section from all over the country. Lots of people are playing with these ideas, whether they're consciously trying to save water or not. And it's just a fun way to think about it um, as, as an extra thing you can do. And, and whether you are, you believe in climate change or not, uh, for, for whoever or wherever you are, water conser- a conservation is important no matter what mind thought process you have because it's important to everything. It is. I mean, it's our it's our most precious resource. And um, when you think about pouring drinking water on your garden, your lawn, when you really think about what kind of resource that is, it, it can really seem crazy. I mean, especially in the drier climate. So um, it, it is. It's something that people all over the country are um, just trying to do a better job of not wasting this resource uh, where they can plant more appropriately for the kind of rainfall they get. And um, and have fun while they're doing it because we're not talking about just we're not talking about cactus here. We're talking about all kinds of gardens and appropriate gardens for where people live and the plants that want to grow there. And there's and and people may not be aware of this. Again, in certain municipalities and townships, some places you cannot collect rainwater, or there are taxes on the rain that falls on your property. So that's a whole other mess in itself. Um, I, I'm not going to advise this, but my advice would be. Do it, and then if you get caught, deal with it then. <laughs> ask uh, ask forgiveness yes. instead of permission. Because yeah. I think that is absolutely insane that, oh, you can't collect water that's falling from the sky because it's in our town and we're going to tax it. That That is backwards to me. Well, and, and two, there are different ways of collecting rainwater. Yes. So it might be illegal in some places to have a rainwater cistern. But it would be perfectly legal and perfectly appropriate to grade your garden in such a way that the water goes into rain gardens or that it funnels right. toward plants that need that extra bit of water. And that's a way you can passively collect that rainwater. You're not collecting it. You're just directing it to the places directing on your it. property that needs yep. it. Yeah, exactly. We're talking with Pam Pennick, an avid gardener and author. Um, so you set up a bottle tree, which I think is a really neat thing. What is a bottle tree and what is its history? Bottle trees are traditional in southern gardens, although I've seen them uh, in gardens all over the country in my, in my travels. But it's a kind of folk art. It's really just you're collecting bottles. Traditionally, they're blue bottles. Um, my collection of blue bottles comes from sake bottles that somebody gave me, but I think some Chardonnays come in blue wine bottles. Any kind of blue bottle traditionally sometimes white bottles or clear bottles and you just stick them on dead branches of a tree or maybe you make your own tree by putting a post in the ground and um you know banging some nails into it and and putting your bottles on that way i've seen people do it any number of ways it's a very creative kind of way to add a little color to your yard and if you put it if you put your bottle tree where the light shines through it you know then you get this extra bit of color and flash in your garden i've even seen somebody put one in a focal point spot in their yard and then they put blue Christmas lights on it that were on a timer. So every night, you know, and during the day it would shine and then at night it would light up um, with those blue lights, which was pretty cool. Um, You can, you can make it out of anything, but um, as far as the history of it, it's a cultural practice. People say that came from Africa to the U S via the slave trade and blue bottles were thought to capture evil spirits and prevent them from harming people. So people would hang blue bottles out on their trees um, or sometimes from wires hanging from trees. I don't know if that history is correct or not, but for sure the bottle tree is very popular in the South and easy and fun to put into any gardens anywhere. I mean, I've seen them all the way up to Seattle and on the East Coast, so they've definitely migrated. Now, you use stock tanks in your garden. How do you utilize them and why and what is, for those who are not familiar, what is a stock tank? A stock tank is a galvanized metal container that's used for watering your your cattle or your horses. So you see them more often in farm country or ranch country. Um, we have ranch supply stores on the outskirts of Austin here where you can, where you can find them very readily. Um, but I've seen them in various parts of the country. Again, it's really, if you're on, you know, near some land where people would be, um, keeping cows and that sort of thing. Sometimes they're called stock tanks, sometimes cattle troughs, but what they're just great because they're, they're very portable. It's easy to pick one up, um, bring it home. They come in different sizes, like three foot diameter, maybe even two foot diameter, big eight foot diameter stock tanks, 
And you can use them for um, container gardens. A lot of people use them for planting vegetables in, getting their vegetables up off the ground so it's easier to garden. Um, I like to use them for containers for agaves which I grow a lot of here in Austin. It gets them up off the ground, so it keeps their roots dry and keeps my dog from poking his eyes out on their leaves, which is a plus. Um, Of course, if you use it for something like that, you do have to poke holes in the bottom of it. I usually just go around with a nail and a hammer and just bang some holes in the bottom, and then you leave the drainage cap unscrewed. It's meant to be a watering container, right, for for cattle. So you you have a drainage hole there. You just unplug that. Um, but if you leave it plugged, they're also great for making container ponds out of. They're really easy. You just get a flat level space, put a little you know, tamped uh, paver base or gravel down, and then you can put your stock tank on top of that and fill it up with water and throw some water lilies in there. And in our climate, you don't have to winterize it or anything. You can just leave those up all winter. And um, it's easy. No digging. And you have yourself a little pond in the backyard. Absolutely. Well, Pam, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us and the education uh, on many different levels here. How can people find out more about you and purchase your books? Um, I encourage listeners to visit my blog, which is called digging at pinnock.net, or you could just Google digging blog to find me. Um, I've been blogging there since 2008, mostly about Texas gardens and water-wise design and plants, but I also travel quite a bit, and I always visit gardens when I travel, and I'll share gardens from all over the country on my on my website. Um, the books can be found anywhere. Books are sold, as they say. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them in bookstores that still carry gardening books, and, um, and I hope people will check them out. Well, Pam, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your knowledge with Holly and myself and all of our listeners. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Protect your plants from damage with the 3-in-1 Plant Guard and Special Blend Fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com and code radio10 to save 10% off your order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. It's a struggle to find fruit that isn't a disappointment or a waste of money, especially peaches at the grocery store. You bring them home, they turn mealy and gross. Well, Tree Riot Fruit Company has the answer. They deliver fruit straight from the farm, obsessed with quality, so you can actually experience the joy of a great-tasting fruit. Love Georgia peaches? Tree Ripe delivers the best peaches you'll ever eat directly from the farm within days of being picked. Peach season starts June 15th and goes through August 4th. In July, they also deliver Michigan blueberries. You can find them at over 400 Peach Stops events throughout the Midwest or have fruit delivered directly to your home. All the event details and ordering information can be found at their website, tree-ripe.com. An extra bonus for you listeners, get 10% off your first purchase when you order online only, tree-ripe.com, by using coupon code HOLLY10, H-O-L-L-Y-1-0. A little bit of summer is what the whole year is all about. Barbecues, parties with friends, the fun is endless, unless the sun or or thunderstorms have damaged your outdoor furniture. Keep it looking brand new with custom protective covers from CoversAndAll.com. They have fabric choices for days that are 100% waterproof, coated to protect against sun, and can be custom designed for any size or shape, and placing or removing them. Easy peasy. Visit CoversAndAll.com and use code GARDEN25 at checkout to save 25% on your purchase. Thanks for listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. The Garden with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Tree Ripe, Covers in All, Ironwood Tool Company, Timber Pro Coatings, Blue Natural Green Products, Algae Men, Dr. Zyme, Happy Leaf LED, Rescue, Big Tool Rack, Hot Bin Composting, Proclamation Goods. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. 
Big show we've had, and we've still got time. It's time for your questions, our answers to the top of the hour. If you've got a question, send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to talk with us, give us a call, 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Toll-free, coast-to-coast. If you can't get you on the show, leave a message, and we will call you back with the answer to your question, 1-800-927-SHOW. Brought to you by Proclamation Goods. Proclamation Goods creates cookware for the eco-conscious home chef. Their pans are non-toxic, have a lifetime warranty, and are made in Wisconsin. Their award-winning stainless steel, procl- their award-winning stainless steel Proclamation Duo cookware set is a 12-inch skillet and a stock pot that doubles as a wok. Best of all, the skillet and stock pot hinge together to form a Dutch oven. It's two pans with the versatility of 10, empowering you to cook more with less. If you care about your health and strive for a more sustainable lifestyle, then Proclamation Goods is for you. Supply is limited, so order is not proclamationgoods.com. All right. Had a bunch of questions come in this week. Thank you very much for those. Uh, and we're going to see what we can get through here. The first question here is sponsored by Fleet Farm and fleetfarm.com. Holly, uh, places near me are starting to put their seeds on sale. Will the seeds be good for next year's season of planting? Yes, seeds can be good for several years after they are bought. And this is by the sell-by date. If kept in a cool, dry place based on the variety of seed you have, um, you know, maybe three to five years, seven years. A rule of thumb is every year the seed is not planted, it will lose 10% of its viability or chance it will germinate five-year-old seeds so half would grow. Also, the side, size of the seed, yep. uh, like radish, carrot seeds are smaller as opposed to like pumpkin and sunflower seeds. Right. Uh, onions, leeks, you're maybe squeezing two years at max out of them with a gr- dramatic decrease in viability after that. So, yeah, certainly uh, purchase them if you can get them for a fraction of the cost. Um, if you're a, you go to jungseeds.com, coupon code one zero. TG22, get 10% off your order as uh, seeds go on sale across the country. All right, Holly, uh, what type of fertilizer do you recommend? Well, we have we have three that we would recommend uh, for you. Uh, each have their own benefits. Uh, we would suggest you could use Ivy Organics uh, 6 Macro, uh, ivyorganics.com, use a uh, Code radio ten get ten percent off your order. You can use Simple Grow uh, worm castings. Uh, we, we've talked about that on the program. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, Johnny Appleseed Organics is another organic means of feeding your p- soil that feeds your plants. So there's a couple of different options when it comes to fertilizer. And and Holly, you can jump in if you want. When it comes to fertilizer, we want to really avoid. We, well, we want to avoid the chemical fertilizers because they're, they're not... Because your plants become addicted to them, essentially. Okay. So when you use chemical fertilizers, um, something that starts with the word miracle, you are feeding your plants essentially what's called plant crack. Well, there's other companies yes. that make similar product like that, but right. yes. But your plants become addicted to them. So they on rely... A, on a regimen. Right. Uh, yeah. So they rely on getting that boost from the plant food, the plant, the artificial synthetic fertilizer, as opposed to if you're building your soil, then your plants um, have a healthier ecosystem to grow in where they're, they're getting their nutrients naturally and organically um, from the soil versus a synthetic chemical. And there's also some, um, you get really technical there. <clears throat> there's some there are negative and positive charges that the synthetic will attract to the water and the organic will repel the water. It's a whole whole thing, but simply put, the organic, the plant will use as needed. The synthetic, the plant will use it all up as quickly as possible, so there can be problems there. All right, here, Holly. Last week, near my peppers, I had white blobs, uh, a white blob that was about one foot wide and two foot long and appeared in my garden. I would describe it as looking like a giant white sponge, and the next day it was gone. What was this? Sounds like that is called dog vomit slime mold. It's not toxic, but it does um, occur like in warmer weather, moist conditions, and it feeds on decomposing organic matter. It's also a decomposer 
itself sometimes you don't see it because if it's uh you will see it like in mulched areas but sometimes you don't notice it because it just kind of pops up if you don't walk towards the area in your yard it disappears usually within a day or two um but it's just it's just something that occurs naturally it's not a bad thing it'll go away just don't touch it or, or take it in the house or or anything like that but yeah totally totally cool all right. Uh, question about zucchinis. I have uh, zucchini. I have a lot of leaves on my plant, and uh, should I trim them back? I have very few zucchinis. Is this good? Is this bad? If so, how do I do it? Yeah. So you can. Um, it's not required to to do the trimming of the zucchini leaves, but you can remove two to three stalks or leaves of the stalks. Um, yeah, take it down right to the base, the growth, uh, the, the main growth uh, stem or the, the growth. Take that stalk of the stem, cut it down. You don't want to remove too many, otherwise you kill the plant. But if you uh, remove a couple to allow a little more sunlight in there, maybe allow some pollinators to get in there, it can stimulate the plant to produce more flowers and more zucchini. So that is that is a doable thing. It's not uh, just be careful how much you trim off uh, when it comes to that. All right, here. I have tomato plants, and I have a problem. They are tall and bushy. Someone told me to cut the top of them off, and I've never heard of this before. Can you advise on the cutting of the top of the tomatoes off? My plants are bushy, lots of flowers, and some green tomatoes are forming. Uh, I did not prune. I, I do prune the suckers. Um, anything you can help me with? Should I cut the top growth off? I I mean I I wouldn't. Um, tomato plants. Some tomato plants get bush, bushy. Some get viney. But I wouldn't cut the top. No. Off. I would just let it do its thing. You can prune the suckers. And if you don't know what a sucker is, if it's if, it's if you look at the main stem of the branch and then you look at the offshoot, there'll be a um, a growth between that um, junction. conjunction. Yeah. yeah. So that's a sucker. You can trim those. We don't because we just plant too many tomato plants. But you can trim those. But I wouldn't cut the top off. That might inhibit the growth of the plant. Right. And we're looking at uh, late July. If the plants are tall and bushy, let them be. Now, if you're going to get into that time frame, wherever you're at in the country, where you're about 30 days to the last or to the the first average frost in your area and you've got a lot of green tomatoes on your plant and some of them are changing tomatoes based on the size of the fruit will take 20 to 30 days from flower to harvest then cut the top eight inches of your growth tip off of your tomato plant to stress it into putting all its energy in the production of the fruits that's hanging on the plant so you're not harvesting green tomatoes but in the middle of the summer don't do it. That can actually inhibit the growth, and it will potentially put that plant in a shock form that it won't produce anything else. It will just produce what's on it and be done. So let the plant grow. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine, and uh, have fun with that. All right, one last question here. I see a lot of posts on the social media platforms where they have an image of a bug and they are asking about what is the best thing that you could spray to kill the bugs. Is this a knee jerk reaction? Shouldn't we look at what else is going in our garden? And I understand that there should be a balance of good and bad bugs. We shouldn't assume that one bug means a thousand and sprayed or am I wrong on that? Yeah. So you do want to look at the bugs. Sometimes you might, it's just like, when little kids see bees and they think that the bees are going to sting them. Or a spider in the or house. a spider in the house, uh -huh. yeah. Or our cat sees a spider and wants to get it. Um, and I will relocate spiders a lot of times outside because they look like they would be healthier outside than in my, in my home. Um, so, yeah, you look at your garden, you might see a strange bug on a leaf of a plant one day. And until you start seeing a few more, I wouldn't necessarily be concerned. Also, a knee-jerk reaction, yes. You should not, you know, become the uh, local exterminator of your garden just because you see a bug that seems unwelcome. You want to do some research. You want to look into it, whether it be contacting us, your local university extension, um, you know, a trusted friend who might know about the insect, something like that. You want to just, you know, give it a chance and see 
what it could be. Now, if you walk out and let's pick, uh, you got four zucchini plants. You walk out and you look under your zucchini plants and every leaf has got thousands and thousands of pick a bug. Then we're looking at, okay, what do I need to do in order? Is the plant salvageable first of all? Should we just rip them up as disappointing and depressing as that is and just toss them out in the street or the burn pile because they're infested with bugs beyond understanding? Or is there something in which we can choose organically to get back in check the ecosystem in your garden? So those are things in which um, you don't want to need jerk reaction just because you saw one bug. However, if you see bunches and hundreds and thousands of bugs infestation a certain variety of plant, then the thought comes to what do I need to do in order to get rid of those and get everything back into check because something's out of balance here. So keep that in mind. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? Hey, you can do that by going to our uh, your favorite search engine, not ours, your favorite search engine, and typing in the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Or you can send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to the show. You can also find all of our content at our parent website, the thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Tune in next week to the program. We're going to talk about composting as well as I've always been told to do this in the garden. And we will go over. You can make that at home. Three topics, uh, three segments of fun next week. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.